Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Audrey Huang, and I'm a frontline bookseller at Belmont Books. Belmont Books is a locally owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts. We are so excited tonight to be launching Farah Heron's new book, Camilla in Charge. She's in conversation tonight with Lily Chu, a debut author of The Stand-In, and Kate Spencer, author of In a New York Minute. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have a number of virtual events coming up, including John Papernick, author of I Am My Beloveds, in conversation with Steve Yarborough this Thursday, and Peter Swanson, author of Nine Lives, in conversation with Lynn Constantine, which is next Wednesday. You can register for these and all of our other events at our website, belmontbooks.com, which is also where you can purchase all three of these books. And I'm telling you right now, you are in for a treat because all three of these books are so much fun and so great. So the format tonight is that the three authors will be in conversation for about 45 minutes and then we'll answer any audience questions. If you have any questions for the authors, please type them into the Q&A section and we'll get to them as many questions as we can. And also feel free to use the chat, double check to make sure that your chat is set to everyone and not just to the hosts and panelists. So after her childhood raised in Bollywood, Monty Python and Jane Austen, Farah Heron wove complicated story arcs and uplifting happily ever afters in her daydreams while pursuing careers in human resources and psychology. She started writing these stories down a few years ago and never looked back. She writes romantic comedies and women's fiction full of huge South Asian families, delectable food, and most importantly, brown people falling stupidly in love. She lives in Toronto with her husband, two children, and a rabbit named Strawberry. And she recently adopted two cats, one of which is named Mr. Darcy. Lily Chu loves ordering the second cheapest wine, wearing perfume all the time, and staying up too late with a good book. She writes romantic comedies with strong Asian characters, and the stand-in is her rom-com debut. She lives in Toronto with her family, which includes two cats and a chameleon. Kate Spencer is the, is the co-host of the award-winning podcast Forever 35, and author of the memoir, The Dead Moms Club. In the New York Minute is her first novel. She writes a bi-monthly column for InStyle and her work has been published by the Washington Post, Rolling Stone, Esquire, Cosmopolitan, BuzzFeed, and numerous other places. Pre previously, she worked for as a senior editor and producer at VH1. She lives in LA with her husband and her two daughters. So without further ado, I give you the authors. Hello, thank you for that gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous welcome. Oh, well, I think I can speak for Lily when I say that we are both very excited to be in conversation with you tonight, Far. This is this is a dream come true for me since I uh, slid into your DMs after reading this book <laughs> and gushed about it over and over again. I, I loved Accidentally Engaged. It was such a treat to get to read Camila Knows Best. So before we launch into our uh, questions and conversation, we thought we, you could get started by just kind of giving us the overall uh, quick elevator pitch for what Camila is about without, without revealing any spoilers. I think we're going to try to keep it spoiler free tonight. Okay. Um, so this is Camila Knows Best. Um, fun fact, this is the UK cover. You can see it is exactly the same as the North American cover. <laughs> Um, which is interesting because my for accidentally engaged the two covers were quite different, but this is the UK edition. It's just a teeny bit smaller. So Camila Knows Best is my um, rom-com retelling of Jane Austen's Emma. Um, it I, I I'm on the fence whether it's a full retelling or inspired by. I think it's a retelling. The story is is does follow the beats of Emma, but it is a South Asian community um, in Toronto, and it is. Um, so set in Toronto, obviously modern day. Um, it follows Camila right there. Camila is fabulous in every way, in every way you can imagine. She's got a great life. She spends a lot of time taking care of her father. Um, she volunteers at the animal shelter. She has a ton of friends. She has a biryani party every weekend. Um, but she is going through a little bit of a blip in her life where she's starting to feel that a little insecure. Um, and that's because her secret nemesis has come back to town. Um, and that is uh, Jana. So when Jana comes back to town, Camila starts having feelings of maybe I'm not as, as amazing as I've always thought I was. Um, and of course she has her best friend Rohan who is actually her 
sister's brother-in-law. So it's a family connection there. And he's her friend and she suddenly becomes worried that um, she's going to lose that friendship when Jana comes back to town. So it's all about her trying to uh, hang on to Rohan as a friend because he means so much to her and he helps her with her dad and all of the hijinks that happen along the way. Um, and she realizes that the reason that she's so afraid of losing him is because she's starting to develop feelings for her best friend. We are very excited to talk about Rohan because he's very dreamy. <laughs> He's very helpful, he's, he's very stoic and always kind of put together. But one thing that he does very well is that he rolls up his sleeves to reveal his forearms. And Camila is oogling these forearms in many scenes, so much so <laughs> that it stuck out to me and that I was very excited anytime they got mentioned. <laughs> I loved it because it's such a subtle, uh, a subtle move but it's something that you, we all know that feeling of when someone rolls up their sleeves and you just see that little bit of arm, yeah. it feels like the sexiest thing ever. So I would love just kind of to hear how you developed, not just who these two characters were, but how you work in these kind of sexy moments or moments where the characters are realizing I'm attracted to them. And is this something that you've experienced in your own life? Are you a forearm person? I don't know if I'm actually a forearm person. Um, I, the thing with Rohan is he's, he, she calls him a suit a lot. He shows up to the biryani party every week in a suit. He, he says he comes straight from work, but she's convinced it's because he wants to look like the stuffy, the stuffy important executive all the time. Um, so that forearm isn't something that's out very much. She, uh, Camila wears these like extravagant dresses everywhere and, and dresses for theme and he shows up in a suit. So when she gets a, a view of that forearm, because it's um, because it's always covered up with like uh, silk shirts and and like expensive suits, I think that becomes a little bit of um, it, it 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 becomes a little bit of like a little bit of a taboo, something she's not used to seeing. And that, and I think that I, I kind of use that device as she notices them, and then maybe a couple chapters she notices them again, and then a little bit quicker she notices them again, and a little bit. So how often she's noticing the forearms is kind of it's, it's a way of showing how her attraction is growing. Um, and she doesn't realize the fact that she's focusing at yeah. one point. Like she's like, I've been staring at them for so long now and I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with me. And then there's also a scene where he has, he's wearing like very trendy pants that are a little bit cropped. So his ankles are out too. And she just loses it. She's like, this is just too much for her. Um, so I like using, I like using that kind of something I like to, to zero in on one thing that the person will notice more and more and more and more as you go um, just to create that that sexual tension that little bit of chemistry a nice one too because it also shows him loosening up a little bit so it's kind of it really works both ways I, I that was so satisfying as a reader yeah when he actually starts rolling up his sleeves instead of wearing the suit all the time yeah. and that shows him kind of unraveling as well yeah so far, it's an M of retelling. How do you decide how close you're going to stay to the actual source book? Like, how do you decide what you're going to put in, what you're going to take out? Did you just put in your favorite scenes? Um, like, what's the process on doing that? So I started out. Um, I started out with reading Emma again and watching the movies because the movies, of course, are easier. You can get it done in an hour and a half instead of spending however long. And then I just started, I wrote a synopsis of Emma. I wrote everything that happens in it. And then I plugged in my characters because I had been thinking about my characters for a while and figured out how I could alter it to the story. The biggest issue with retelling something from that long ago is story structure has changed quite a bit since then, right? Um, and that's something that, especially I spoke to my agent about it before, like before I started writing it. And she reminded me again that back then um, the protagonists didn't usually have goals. They weren't working towards something. And if you think about Emma, like she had things that she wanted, but there wasn't a, um, she, there was just basically all these things that were happening to her as opposed to her going after things. So I, I knew from the beginning that I needed uh, my character to have more agency, to have more goals. Um, and also more, uh, more modern, like Camila has the goal of trying to um, get her father to stop working so for his health and she needs to do that she needs to gain more respect in her uh, in her industry and to be able to take 
be able to have clients uh, trust her as an accountant. So that goal, obviously that doesn't exist in Emma. That would be very funny if it did. But that kind of like agency where she has something she's working towards, that's something just for her as opposed to for somebody around her. That was the main thing that I had to work with. And then I ended up playing around with things. I played around with some of the main plot points just to add some, otherwise people would know exactly everything that's gonna happen. So just to add some sense of surprise for the reader, especially at the end, I played around with the way things happened. And then I tried to put my favorite scenes in there. Um, I ended up getting rid of some and putting them in because I didn't want it to be that, um, that exact by the story, but I don't know. I, I, like, I, I didn't really have a, a plan going in. I just kind of worked with it. There was a lot of drafts of this book. I, I rewrote it many times. Okay, favorite Emma scene that did make it into the book? That did make, oh, of course, the last scene, right? The 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 declaration of love where he yeah. says in Emma, if I loved you less, I could, I could explain myself better. So I had to have that line in there turned around, obviously not exactly the same. So that was, a, that was an important one for me. Um, and I literally in that scene, I had it. So my favorite Emma um, movie is the old Kate Beckinsale one. Mm. And in that old movie, um, that final scene was outside of her house in her garden um, where Knightley says to her, if I loved you less, whatever. So to kind of mirror that, I had it similarly. I had it in a gazebo in a park just so that the outdoor setting, so it would kind of feel the same. Yep. I, I loved seeing in the acknowledgements that Lily was a beta reader for this book and you mentioned that you did a lot of drafts can you can you kind of just describe what the process was like because I, even, even with the retelling and having that structure it, it's still you're shaping it and creating a brand new story and a, and a brand new book and it sounds like it it was challenging yeah it was challenging um you know what was extra challenging about this book is I pretty much wrote it the um, first quarter of 2020 and or, or first to second quarter of 2020 so everybody remembers what that was like um, and it was really hard like the, the the book was already contracted by that point and I already knew basically what I was writing but to actually sit down and write something that's supposed to be completely joyful and fun um, at the very beginning of the pandemic turned out to be one of the hardest things I've ever done um, so I ended up kind of losing my way a few times probably mostly because of the story I was trying too hard to keep within the, the Emma uh, backbone, within that, that structure, um, without really being, um, without feeling free to kind of do my own thing and go and, and move away from the, the skeleton structure of it. Um, so I ended up having to rewrite it. And then I ended up having to rewrite it. This isn't working, this isn't working. Um, eventually I got it to the point where I could, and I, this is how I usually do is I get, get it to the point where I'm comfortable somebody looking at it. So I sent it to a few people. One of them was Lily. Um, and it's invaluable to me to have somebody else's eyes on it. Uh, I don't think this book especially would be the book it is now if I didn't have some lots of eyes. I remember Lily, you and I ended up talking for an afternoon about it. We yeah. got on to Zoom because of course we can't meet each other. Um, and just talking after, after she'd read it. Um, about how to basically fix all the things that what weren't working at the time. Um, and, then, and then when I handed it in, then I went, there wasn't actually a lot with my editor. We didn't end up making a huge amount of changes, um, maybe because of the help I had had before that. But at the beginning, at the very beginning, this book was a completely different beast. So before I ask Farah, your manicure. Yes. <laughs> I believe there is a special, you have done your nails just for release day. I have. Let's see if you can see them. Oh, Beautiful. So good. So nice. Well, the the uh, both hands are done. Yep. I see potatoes, paw prints. Uh, potatoes, paw prints, and then the raindrops, and then the umbrella. umbrella. So Camilla is extremely feminine. She loves fashion. She loves entertaining um, you know, she does her hair, she's beautifully dressed, and she really struggles because a lot of people see this as her not being serious, her not being good at her job. Um, and I, I want to talk a bit about how you kind of played with that idea of femininity not defining who she is as a person, while at the same time it is very much who she is as a person and why people thought she couldn't be an, a serious accountant and a woman who really liked manicures. Yeah, that's something I did very intentionally when I started writing it. Uh, 
Camila was very much inspired by two, sorry, there's fluff everywhere, two characters on TV is um, Alexis Ship from Alexis from <laughs> Schitt's Creek and uh, Tahani from The Good Place. So I took those two characters and I was like, why don't we ever see romances with people like, especially Alexis? I'm like, why is there never a romance book with somebody like that? And it's somebody who um, who gets a who she has a lovely arc in the in the show. Like she she learns a lot about herself and she falls in love and all of those great things happen. But she's very much seen as superficial. I'm like, well, why does that mean she's superficial? Why is superficial a bad thing for one thing? But also, why is the fact that she loves designer clothes? Um, or loves to party with her friends, why does that mean that she's not normally worthy of these kind of stories? So that was really where I was coming from. And then it kind of evolved, like I was thinking about like the trope that you hear, although like not like other girls that you hear over and over again. Um, you see it in romance all the time. Well, she, she's not like other girls. She doesn't know she's pretty or she, she, doesn't, she, do, she, she doesn't care how she looks when she, she just wears a sweatshirt and converse. I was like, why can't we have somebody who's exactly like other girls? Like she is the girliest of, of other girls. And that doesn't necessarily mean that she's not into, um, like, sorry, that she's that she can't be intelligent, that she can't be an accountant, that she can't be, have a social conscience or any of those things. So I kind of wanted to turn that idea on its head. Um, like I myself, like I, I did my nails. Um, we were just talking about my hair. I did a blowout today. I've always been very girly, so to speak. Um, and I don't, I hate the idea that that means that I'm not able or not worthy of, of those kind of um, things that people, that people look down on you for those things, feminine, feminine interests. Mm -hmm. I think this, this comes up throughout the book as something Camila deals with. And I, I, I love reading it, how you kind of create these male characters who are both uh, feminists, but also have moments of participating a little bit in sexism and watching uh, the women in their lives kind of combat that, um, especially kind of the larger patriarchal system uh, and, and work and expectations, uh, gender roles at work. So I would love to dig in how, how you think about incorporating um, feminism into your into your writing and into these characters uh, I don't know if I necessarily think that think that through I mean with Camila I did because I really tried to make her um, I, I made her very feminine as as a to combat that idea that feminine equals bad um, but overall like my my male characters you're right they do um, they do participate in the patriarchy not all of them are um, they're tr some my heroes are trying really hard yeah um, but other characters are not necessarily trying um, like for example Camila's dad is a lovely 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 man um, but there's so many instances where he's not for example he won't go to the doc he won't let Camila take him to the doctor he goes to the doctor which is great um, but he'll only let a man take him to the doctor instead of one of his daughters because he doesn't feel that that um, that these the issues that he's talking about. He's like, no, I need I need a man to take me. I don't want to talk to to women about things like that. Um, and so Camila loves her father so much, and she has to come to terms with the fact that not only is he old fashioned, but she knows from the beginning that he doesn't value her because he doesn't even that little thing that he, she can't take him to the doctor. She knows he doesn't value her, and then of course it gets a lot worse as the as the, um, the story goes on. But how do you deal with that? How do you combat um, that kind of thing when it's your father, when it's your, like, her? she's so super close to him, she takes care of him, he takes care of her, and she has to accept, and then she has to accept that he doesn't value her as much, but also then she's internalizing it. She's internalizing all of those things that she's heard. Um, the fact that she worries about her hair so much means that she can't do the the complex um, the complex cases that they come through the accounting firm and things like that. Um, so she's internalizing it, and she needs to overcome that. And she has so I do try to help my characters get over it. But I think the I think for all of us to kind of navigate um, navigate being a woman while being surrounded by flat out misogyny in some cases, and then just people that are just kind of blind to how patriarchy is hurting everybody. It's just something that we all have to deal with. Yeah, you have a, you have a uh, woman character too, who's kind of <laughs> uh, putting a lot of her internalized misogyny onto Camila as well, and judging Camila by how she dresses. And I think that, 
I, I love reading the book through Camila's eyes, like when she meets Anil and, and realizes she notes that he has a lot of women in his business incubator and just kind of catching these moments uh, of how these characters are thinking about each other and receiving each other was really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you say Anil. Like I kind of, with that character, I kind of tried to make it so that he, just because because I'm working with that character now, in case anybody know, I'm writing that character right now. Um, and I, I really tried with Camila that he doesn't necessarily, that she doesn't necessarily understand him. Um, she doesn't understand what he's about. She sees very much on the surface and she probably assumes that he is just like everybody else where he's not taking her as seriously. Um, but she's still, she still, she, she thinks he's delightful and she spends time with him and she invites him to parties. And I think she knows the whole time that he's not necessarily the person, um, he's also not really seeing her for who she is the whole time. Since you mentioned Neil, let's go into <laughs> my favorite character who is Jana. Yes. Who I love so much, so that kind of the Jane stand in. Um, and the concept of the frenemy because you know you have these two women they're both skilled they're both smart um but their parents their families have always kind of deliberately or not pitted them against each other and they end up not being friends so um and i think that many people kind of find that in relationships in, in their lives like you know we're set up against people or sometimes we just set our sights on that person for whatever reason um but i love how you kind of showed the shift in the relationship over time. Yeah, so I, I love that character too. Yeah, I, um, he's my favorite. Yeah, she's she's uh, she's a difficult character. She was a very difficult character to write. Um, she and Camila have known each other their whole lives, um, and it's funny. Uh, I, this is something that I see a lot in. Asian communities where, why can't you, I, I mean, it's possible it's in other communities, I grew up Asian, so, but why can't you be more like so-and-so or why, right? So I'm imagine, I always think, I'm like, okay, so I have, my parents are here, so I'm going to be, hi mom, hi dad. Um, so, so I've had people that people have compared me to my whole life, and those, those people aren't necessarily my frenemies, like I don't necessarily internalize it and believe it all, but I was like, well, what if it goes to a different level, like obviously um, Camila was was not treated well by her mother. Um, so to, to have it go to an, another level um, where the comparing is more, um, more negative, it's like I can understand that you would be rubbing against that person and the sight of them is just reminding you of everything that you think is wrong about yourself. Um, yeah. And then when they both had it from both of their, their families growing up, um, Camila and Jana are completely different people. Um, and that's why they were not able to kind of like look past all the stuff that their families had been saying about them. Um, but I, I really, really enjoyed creating that kind of friendship arc between them of going from, um, from basically not, not liking, she's her frenemy, she's her, not frenemy, I don't even, like she calls her her secret nemesis because nobody knows she's her nemesis. Mm. Um, and the insecurities that that all came to, to surface when Jana comes back to town, uh, that Camila had, she's like, I've gotten over these insecurities. I wasn't supposed to be dealing with this anymore. And now this one person is the person that's making making me feel like less less right now. Um, so to create, to start from that place and then make them um, kind of see the world through each other's eyes at the end was really, really fun. Yeah. And you have a great scene Okay, this is probably not going to show me in my best light, but it's where uh, Camilla and her friend are talking about Jana, and it's that kind of testing where it's like, do you don't want to be the first one to say you don't like the person? So you're kind of <laughs> testing out the waters. And say, so what do you think? What do you think of them? And she's just so relieved that she's <laughs> that friend is yeah. like validating her, and uh, that just made me really laugh. So it's like, um, oh, thank God, um, nobody, everybody else. <laughs> I don't have to, it doesn't have to be a secret, secret nemesis anymore. Yeah. Um, so I just, I loved how you put that in because it felt very, like you just, you have a great way of putting these little like moments that you recognize in your own life where it's like, yeah. oh yeah, I've done that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that ultimate realization that the insecurity is not coming from the, you know, it's not coming from the other person that you're insecure about. It's all inside, you know, it's, we can all relate to that no matter how old we are, that never really goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask about the cooking in the book? Because you, you handle cooking scenes in such a wonderfully relatable, but also very sexy way. There's a really fun cooking disaster that kind of heightens the romantic connection. What is inherently sexy about cooking to you? Why do you think these kind of kitchen moments and, and cooking scenes work so well in romance? I, that's a very good question. I don't know if I've ever, ever thought it through. I love cooking and I love writing about food. So I always end up putting it in there. But I mean, cooking is very sensual. It's uh, tactile, um, especially I love scenes where people are showing somebody mm -hmm. um, like the scene that Rohan's teaching her to make a momo and his hands are on her. So we can have physical contact, um, ex uh, forearms too, right? Because you want to roll Thank up you. those sleeves first. Many, many opportunities <laughs> as we can get. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So all of those things kind of put together, but there's also something amazing about watching somebody do something really well. That was something I definitely did in, in Accidentally Engaged where Rena's baking the bread and she's kneading bread. And Nadim is just like, wow, I could just watch you knead bread forever. So that competence porn, I think is called, mm -hmm. where you're just watching somebody just, just excel at something. And when you're creating that sexual contact and sorry, sexual tension, um, it's really great to have that, that admiring the person's abilities, what they can do well. I've never heard of competence porn before. Competence porn. It's wa just watching somebody do something very well. It's, yeah. it's exciting. Yeah. Like, so like, seven, like drive stick. Where if somebody can, can like back up a trailer. I once read, I don't remember the, I don't <laughs> remember what book it was, work. but there was a scene where the guy was backing up a trailer and there was a horse in the trailer. And the guy was, it was a male, male romance. And the other guy was just like losing it just from watching how effortlessly, because that's a hard thing to do, right? Yeah. Yes. I've seen it in books where it's, um, you know, when you're backing up and you put your arm kind of like behind the other <laughs> seat, the other person's just like, <gasps> Yes. So it's a slow burn, yeah. right? Like slow burn, friends to lovers. Um, so you really crammed in like trope, tropes, 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 which I'm very, very pleased about because um, <laughs> I really like both those things. Um, you know, was it hard to kind of create that huge past relationship for Camila and Rowan because they've known each other since she was a baby. Like, you know, it's it he he was the first person to, no, she was the first one to fall asleep on him, I think is how you phrase mm, yeah. it. So they've yeah. each other for so long. There's so much history there. Um, was it hard to figure out like what to keep in to kind of show how close they were without overloading the readers with like all of their childhood and growing up and now getting together? Yeah, so I, and, and I quite um, like very intentionally didn't add like flashbacks of their past yeah. or anything like the story is only right now, um, despite the fact that they've known each other forever. So using the source material using Emma was the best thing for that. Um, in Emma, I remember, again, just because I watched the movie several times to, to um, as research, I remember those, those scenes where it's like Emma and her dad and then Knightley comes in and they're all just talking and it's very domestic. Um, it's not always like a big formal, like meeting in a ballroom or something. So I was thinking about those kind of domestic, because they're so close, there's such a close intimacy between the families. It's not, um, there's no formality about when they meet. So that's why I started it with them having breakfast together because I wanted to establish that this is a friend, but it's it's a very close family friend, basically a member of the family. Um, and then getting that getting that friend friends, but with chemistry was really, mm -hmm. really hard. It helps that Camila's personality is so, um, she's like probably flirty like that with everybody. And she's not at all, um, she's very open about everything in her life. So it was very easy for me to do that. I think with another character that would have been harder but creating that, that chemistry between them. Um, and then of course I started out with a little disaster that she causes a little kitchen fire. And whenever there's a disaster, it kind of brings people together, right? Cause you have to overcome it. And so that was basically what, where I kind of started the friends thing. But I'm, again, I had to go through so many drafts to get that right, to get yeah. that chemistry between the friendship, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it, it's, I think it's perfect. Like I think, um, how you you built them up to eventually get to that the final scene because you know it's a romance I, I knew it was coming um, <laughs> but 
I was still like, I was still like, <laughs> and especially with the, you know, the wet sorry stuff you had put in earlier. I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And slow burn is tough that way, right? Because people are like, are, are you going to be able to hang on to it for that long? Yeah. It helps yeah. that there's a lot more going on. Um, there's a lot of subplots, there's a lot of characters. So I could fill time in with that, but it is hard to like keep the tension going long enough so that the reader is not like, okay, enough already. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then Friends Friends is also really hard. Like my other books is kind of almost antagonistic um, mm -hmm. at the beginning. Well, these two are not. And that's that's losing out on the ability. Like the antagonists or enemies to lovers, you've got that chemistry built in at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And this, I didn't have that. So I had to build the chemistry in the friendship, which doesn't it doesn't always work that well. Yeah. But I think <laughs> this is like, you know, when she undone, undoes his... Uh... <laughs> I seem to have really internalized a lot of these. <laughs> I think you did that so well, though. I, I think it comes through so much with Camilla's personality because she's so forward with him, and you can tell she's poking and kind of testing out the relationship in that way. And so I, I did feel like in their friendship there was that kind of sexual tension from the minute we see them together. I think you just yeah. nailed it. They didn't see it. No, of course. I mean, how could they? <laughs> but, but everyone else did. Yeah. Everyone else did. Everyone else did. Can we uh, have a moment where Potato the dog? Yeah. Her name Darcy. Potato the dog. Yeah. Such a potato great was dog. based on a real dog, right? Not long before, um, not long before the lockdown, my husband and I went to the Humane Society just because we, we were at a, a bar nearby, a brewery, and then we walked over there to walk around, and the big they had a big room. I mean, they have, it was, it's one of the biggest ones in Toronto um, and lots of lots of animals, but they had one big room that was just filled with puppies, obviously a new litter, and they're all black except for one brown puppy. And this was like, this was right before lockdown. So I told you, this is right when I was saying, I'm like, oh. and then I took pictures of that one, one brown puppy in the big sea of black puppies and then Potato was born. Oh, was he very round puppy? He was. <laughs> So cute. My, my favorite, I, I see that um, my editor Leah is here too, but my favorite editorial comment on it, she's like, add more potato, he's cute. He is potato. cute. An yeah. Excellent call. I loved potato. Like, um, could, could do like a spin off novella with potato. Leah's commenting, I yeah. adore potato. <laughs> potato. And I think I love potato because that's the best dog name I've ever heard. Yeah, potato's a good name. Potato is an amazing name. <laughs> and he looks like a potato. <laughs> I have a very like clear mental image of this dog. <laughs> this is very I do rare. too. Yeah, like a very like a like um like a little loaf of bread. Yeah. Bread, yeah, loaf would have been a good name too. With a really cute tail that he wags all the time. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I like I loved all the shelter scenes. I thought those were yeah. those were so great. Like um like having the animals, the the dog prom. All the dog, the dog, prom. dog stuff was fantastic. I'm a cat person, um, but I did like reading about all the puppies. All the puppies, yeah. Yeah, and her dressing up of her pet dog. <laughs> her dressing up her dog. That actually, that same day that we went and saw those puppies at the Humane Society, I saw a little pug wearing a jean jacket. And I took a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have on my camera roll well, on the same day I saw I saw the dog that Potato was based on and then Darcy as well. It, who came who came first in the pet universe? Fictional Darcy in Camila Knows Best or your Darcy? My Darcy. Fictional okay. Darcy came first. My cat Darcy, he might, he's probably sitting outside the door complaining. Um, I got him only a year ago, a, no, a little over a year now. So the book had already been written. And he came with a different name. We got him from a cat rescue and he came with a, a different name, but uh, it was a name that I didn't want to keep him with. And it was very sounded very similar to Darcy. And of course I'm a Jane Austen nut. So the name mm. sounded similar enough. And, and it didn't even occur to me because it was, we got him when I was in, in that between period. Like we, I'd already finished editing the book, but um, no, I hadn't edited it yet, but it was at the be between thing. And I was working on another book. So my mind was all of that other book. So when I named, my cat Darcy, it didn't even occur to me that I just named a, a character Darcy in my book. <laughs> so now he, he thinks he's famous. I mean, he is. <laughs> I, I named both my children names from Jane Austen books without 
meaning to and only it only dawned on me much later so they're they're stuck with that yeah <laughs> my daughter's middle name is Jane I did that on I did that intentionally though so you you are a Jane Austen fan and you have a beautiful author's note I don't know if that if that is in the the book but it's in the advanced reader copy this author note I think about. yeah I think the whole thing I don't okay think good it was so lovely just kind of talking about getting Emma for the first time and your love of Jane Austen and I know it's cliche to ask slash can there really be a favorite but do you have a favorite Austin book or Austin character Emma is definitely my favorite Austin character um but I I think my favorite book Pride and Prejudice was my favorite book for years and years and years but it's funny when you get older taste change and I'm all persuasion now Ooh, um, wow. I love persuasion um but I, always Emma's always been my favorite character I think I I love the I, I love the weird, the, I want to say weirdness, but the heart, the very difficult to love. Like uh, Jane Austen's quote is, I'm going to create a character that no one will love but me. Um, and I think that that character where she is meddling, but very, very um, well-intentioned and she's very doting for her family and she's always there for her friends, but she's also very kind of not really realizing how snobby and clueless she can be. Um, I, I just think the character is so fascinating. But uh, I, I love that second chance romance and persuasion. I think that's just so romantic. So are there other retellings in the future? I don't think so. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. I had this, this dream for years to, to a YA Northanger Abbey, um, just because I don't think it's ever, I've never seen anyone try. You couldn't do Northanger Abbey in an adult book. I think that's just not possible. That story wouldn't work for adults. But as teenagers who are um, not fully developed, I had this idea of writing one. Um, but I actually just recently saw that somebody I know is, is writing to get a publishing deal for a YA Northanger Abbey. So maybe there is a market for it, who knows? I don't have a huge urge to write more inspired by um, Austin. I think I kind of just got it out of the way and now I'll move on. Um, but never say never, who knows? Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the, the questions and Kristen Dwyer did ask, what is everyone's favorite Austin retelling? Clueless, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Clueless is great. Bridget Jones's Diary. Bridget Jones' Diary is very good. I love Bridget Jones' Diary. Um, as for book retellings, I'm, I'm actually reading Sonali Dev's The Emma Project right now. Um, it's funny that Sonali and I both have Emma inspired South Asian com books coming out in the same year. And we purposely did not read each other's books mm -hmm. until like I'm reading it now when mine's coming out. And then I don't think she's going to read. I don't think she's going to, she's going to, no, she's not going to read Camila until it's out as well. till her book is out. Um, so we don't get influenced by each other, but so far it's excellent. It's quite different from Camila. It's um, gender flipped. So the Ooh. Emma character is, is the boy. I loved um, Pride, Prejudice, and other flavors. Yeah, it's a it's an it's a good one. Yeah. All right. Here's another question from this Q and A. I hope it's okay that we're dipping in there. Someone would like to know what your next book idea is. My next book idea. Oh, geez. I Different don't know. from your next. What can you tell us uh, about your next book? I can. Oh, Lily's favorite character from Camila. <laughs> I am so, so excited. Yes. You've got no idea. My my next adult book will be Jana Goes Wild. Um, so that is Jana from Camila Knows Best. And if you've read the book, then you'll know who the hero is, but I'm not going to give it away right now. Um, although I think we mentioned him. Um, and that book is turning out to be super fun in completely different reasons. It actually includes almost all the characters from Camila because they're all on a destination wedding in Tanzania together for Camila and Rohan's wedding. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying, like I really, really enjoyed the travel part of that. <clears throat> and of course I lo absolutely love Tanzania. So to be able to write about it is like a dream come true. But it's at the same time, it's kind of challenging because it's, it's so much more angsty and Jana is so different than Camila and to go from that kind of um, mindset to right to getting into Jana's head um, is challenging. I mean Camila's in the book quite a bit so it's great that they can still kind of like feed off each other 
but it's a very, very uh, different kind of story with a very different kind of character. Um, so that's my next adult book. That'll be out uh, next year, spring, maybe. I don't know yet. But then my next book is actually going to be a, a YA. Um, and I don't have a release date for that. And we haven't announced the cover, the title yet. So I can't say yet. But we just narrowed, we just figured, finally decided on the cover. Um, and it will be out, probably, it will probably be out before the end of the year. And um, if anyone's read my last YA, which was um, Tahira and Bloom, this is a story about Tahira's sister, Samaya. Um, Tahira was the fashion, uh, fashion influencer, fashion designer story. And then her sister, Samaya, is a video game and math nerd. So again, it's a very different kind of character to try and get my head into. Um, the story is about very much about high school politics, like high school politics, I mean like high school gossip, high school cliques, um, and about uh, about kind of trying to figure out where who you are and how to heal after a bad breakup. I, I have just kind of a question that I'm nosy about as a writer um, myself and someone who finds this part of writing very challenging, but you're speaking about kind of switching, getting into the different characters' mindsets as you, you know, move forward on different projects. Have you ever gotten stuck? Has have you ever found a, a character that you're writing to be like you're you're not able to fully get in there, or, or what what is your process for kind of making that transition? Because that is really hard. And and just having gotten to know these characters in Camila, I imagine it's a big shift to go into Jana. So yeah, it's been, I've been dealing with that a lot lately because I'm juggling these two books. I'm juggling Jana and then this YA book with uh, character Samaya and I'm having to go back and forth between them a lot right now. So I just finished edits on Samaya and then I had to do a last revision on Jana and I'm about to go back into edits on Samaya and then Whoa. do one more revision. So it is, and so I'm going back and forth between these two books for the last couple months. It's just been like two weeks there, two weeks there, two weeks there. And I gotta say, it's been incredibly challenging. Um, I had a complete and utter, like, I can't do this. This this job isn't for me, like moments where I just couldn't, I absolutely just couldn't work one day. Um, and it took me, because writers are very not self-aware. Um, it took me a good two days to realize it's because I didn't give myself a break between moving from one to the other. So I had just finished um, my edits on, on my YA, sent it to my editor. And then I had a little bit of time before my second, second round of edits for the YA came in. So I was gonna do a full pass on, on Jana and I couldn't get into it and I just couldn't work. And I was like, my, I can't focus, I can't work. I don't know. And I, I was beating myself up for it. And then all I, all I did is, is I ended up taking, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take a day off. And one day was enough for me to get myself back into the project. I don't actually find it hard to get into the mind once I've found it. Um, but I do find that my my ability to work successful, like to actually work, do the work, I need to have a little bit of a, a transition between them. Um, but it's definitely something that, uh, that that I've just had to learn how to do it because I have. Yeah. These, I mean, I, I, I love it and it's a great place to be that I can have these two separate projects going on at once, but it's challenging. Well, I would say that your answer to me is competence porn. <laughs> you describe how you do that so well and having learned how to do it. I like it. Oh, I think you're unmuted. You're muted. I am. You think I know that by now. No, we all do it. Two years in. So I accidentally clicked a, on a question that and I put down as answer, but we actually hadn't gotten to. So Camila really dwells on how people thought of her in the past. Did something inspire how you wrote her relationship with her parents? Um, so her relationship with her parents is definitely difficult. Um, my parents are here, hi mom and dad. And even if they weren't here, I would say this honestly, is that is they're not based on my parents at all. My parents have been great. My parents are very supportive of me. Um, but there is a lot of, uh, I mean, I have a big family and I see how a lot of our older generations in South Asian communities, how um, they uh, put a lot of pressure on their families, on their, on their kids. So I did take a lot of that from other things I've seen in the community. Um, by no means is it all people are not like that. Um, and like I said, my own family is great. Um, but I love kind of thinking about generational 
um, trauma and how um, how when when my parents and Camila's parents when they first came to Canada or, or wherever um, the difficulties they must have had trying to get get in starting starting over starting their life um, building a family building a community and how some of that um, that hardship can transfer over to their children and how some of the pressure to succeed in a new place can um, can kind of turn into putting too much pressure on, on kids and too much high expectations. And again, mental health is something that I always will, will probably always write about, but it's something I think about a lot because in my past work, I was a counselor and I think about how those things um, that you went through as a kid, because maybe because of the things that your parents had gone through and how those will affect you as an adult and, and how it can affect the relationships that you try to make. So, Mr. Darcy or Potato, if you could only have one of them in your real life, which would it be? And I'm not sure if the person's referring to Mr. Darcy as in Mr. Darcy from the book or Mr. Darcy in your cat as your cat. I hope it's I hope it's Mr. Darcy from the book versus Potato the dog. That would be a real challenge. My my cat is probably sitting outside my door, so definitely he's the one that I would keep. Um, I actually did have a Bichon Frise. Darcy in the book is a Bichon. And I actually did have one growing up and that's why I'm kind of attached to that breed. Um, and his name was Joey. Um, and I know that it's like the best dog in the world. So I would say I'm team Darcy for the book. Although I do absolutely love Potato. Will, will we get to see Potato make a, make a cameo appearance possibly in the book? Yes, Facebook? actually that's Hi. very funny. My um, so no, at first there was no potato in the new book because it's all in Tanzania. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, huh? Um, <laughs> but then it was funny. So they're obviously at the end of the book, they're not in Tanzania. I can see the yes, I got it very excited. So they're not in Tanzania anymore. And so I was talking to my husband about um, just brainstorming how to get the end, end to work. My husband has read Camila. He hasn't read the book I'm working on now, but I was trying to figure out how to wait, make it work. And I was like, well, what if I do this? And I'm like, if I do this, then I can have Darcy and Potato in the book. And then my husband almost started crying. He's like, yes. And I couldn't believe how emotional he got about the idea of putting Potato in the book. So I'm like, if that's how he's acting to put Potato in the book, then I, then I definitely need to figure out how to do this. So I actually just wrote that scene today. I added a scene Wow. last night, actually, with, with Potato. Well, I my husband's he... very invested in these two things. I think he also yeah, asked that question. With my whole family watching. <laughs> You're so supported. I think that's so wonderful. People are, your family is truly invested, not just in your work, but these characters, yes. these animal characters. Yeah, I'm very lucky. I have a very, very amazing family. So what are you all reading now? Or what have you enjoyed recently? Wow. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm reading Sonali Dev's um, The Emma Project and I'm enjoying it. I just finished uh, a book that's coming out next week or the week after. It's Taj McCoy's uh, Savvy Sheldon is Good as Hell, it's called. Yeah, that I was just finished that and it was as good as hell. Like it was fabulous. Wow. I loved it. Very, uh, I love the, I love the, the, the character arc there. Like she really, it's very subtly done where she, she kind of starts embracing self-love and, and accepting of herself. And I thought that was just really well done. And it's got a lot of competence porn though, Kate, because the hero is a contractor. Oh, forget and it. She is a cook and there's lots of scenes of her oh. cooking, like the food in that book, my goodness. So much food so and much so food. effortless food. Yeah. I can't wait. Uh, I, I, um, I'm reading a few things. I have this book at my desk that I've been reading, Grief is Love by Marissa Renee Lee, which um, is a beautiful kind of memoir about grief and losing her mom. Uh, I finished, I got to blurb um, The Mutual Friend by Carter Bays, which comes out in June. He's one of the co-creators of How I Met Your Mother. And I, I absolutely loved it. And then my dear, Publicist, marketing director extraordinaire Estelle Halleck just sent me Abby Jimenez's new book, Part of Your World, which now I'm like, I have to drop everything and read that. And then I'm, I'm constantly reading Ice Planet Barbarians. 
all day long. So <laughs> that's just that's an ongoing theme of my life is that I'm half on a nice planet. I'm um I'm drafting right now, so I'm trying to steer away from from rom coms so I don't uh, get influenced. But I just picked this one up as audiobook. And I'm reading it because I want to get it right. It's Rise of Pop History of Asian America from the 90s to now. I don't know if you can... Oh, it's oh, a right. Really amazing. So I just, just started it and I'm very, very excited. Oh, yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's amazing. Amazing. Oh, shoot. If I had known it was that pretty on the inside, maybe I... Oh, wow. Okay, and there's fold out too. Oh, wow. All right, looks like I'm getting both. Thank you for all the credit that though. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and the book that Farah recommended was Savvy Sheldon, I think Falls in Love. I know feels, Savvy Sheldon. Good. Savvy Sheldon feels good as hell, I think. I'm trying to find links for, I'm trying to find the actual titles of everything. But I will say the rise. I mean, it's the um, it talks about the pop culture in Asian American, in Amer in Asia American, and it's one of those things you didn't realize how much influence there is in the last twenty some years. Yeah, yeah, it looks it really really good. So I'm, this is going to get me back into running. So that and the snow disappearing is going to get me back into running. <sighs> I haven't tried the Ice Planet Barbarians yet, Kate. Do you? Do you recommend? I, I tend to talk about it to everybody I meet. It for for me, it I picked it up uh, right at the kind of when Omicron was really picking up, and I was feeling you know the darkness, um, and so it was just such a like a escape to. And the, there are so many books, you know, you can just never stop, and so. In that sense, it's really been such a wonderful self-care read for me, um, but I do recommend it. I, I think you could, I mean, there are some things I would note that I will, you know, email you about, but I, I think it's a really fun read. I admire the, um, the author's world building skills and the aliens. I am now attracted to blue aliens. To so, blue people. <laughs> yeah. I There's totally something comforting about a long series too. You know, it's still yeah. there waiting for you. I think yeah. that, yeah, I, I've been, I, I've really tried to reflect on kind of what the role that books have played in helping me get through the pandemic. But I think that is such a special thing about a, a large series. You can just keep going and keep going. And so that good feeling never ends. Yeah. All right, if I've counted correctly, you've written four and a half books during this pandemic time or in the process of writing four and a half or completing, uh, right? So uh, there let me count. Uh, yeah. Well, this is my third pandemic release. Oh my um, gosh. So, because Engaged came out a year ago and yeah. then I had Tahira and now Camila. Um, so yeah, and then I wrote, I mean, my, my YA books was kind of a whirlwind. So I, I signed a contract with them and immediately had to start writing, immediately had to write it in like two months. Um, and then even though I wrote, I wrote Tahira after Camila, it came out before because it was just a shorter time, um, just because that publisher doesn't, doesn't have as lo long a process. Uh, so yeah, so I have written <laughs> and then like I'm working on Jana right now, and then there'll be two more books after Jana. Um, so up until 2025, I'll be publishing rom-coms with Forever, which I'm thrilled about. Well, we are just as thrilled. If you were able to launch um, Camila in real life, I mean, for Chai Factory at a barbershop quartet, I did. would there be Puppy Prom for this one? Yeah, that's a good one, right? Yeah. I, I was actually just thinking about that today because um, I was thinking back to that, that my, my first launch party for my debut, my publisher hired a barbershop quartet and we had it in a bar in Toronto and it was amazing. I was like, will I ever get to have a live launch again? <laughs> um, I don't know where I would have Camila's launch. Probably, uh, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know if she would necessarily have it in a dog place, um, dog friendly place maybe. 
Uh, Estelle saying maybe a movie theater. Yeah, I watch Bollywood movies. Oh, yeah. Or an Indian restaurant would work. Um, mm. I, I really wanted to have a launch for Engaged last year because there's a bookstore in Toronto that has a bakery attached. Mm. Um, so I had the idea of, of having it in like a, reg, like a normal launch instead of my weird barbershop quartet party, but like a normal bookstore launch, but that there's like a f French bakery attached to it. Um, but that never happened. Maybe it one day. Like a big day. delayed launch. Like everyone who had a book in the city, we just all <laughs> rented a hall and we just had one big. One uh, big. Launch. We're, we're going to do that, Lily. Yeah. yeah. Once, once this is all over. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. We'll have a big like Toronto launch. Blowout. That sounds fun. Yeah. yeah. I'll fly up. Yeah, definitely. I have one last question for Farah. How do you narrow down as to what recipe you're going to have at the back of your books? Mm. Um, or two with recipes. engaged, it was it with engaged. It was important for me to pick a recipe that was important in the book, and that's why I went with the egg curry because it was um, it was Nadim's grandmother's um, dish, and it was an important scene. Uh, so that's that one. And then with Camila. I wasn't going to put biryani. It was actually Leah, my editor. She's like, you can put biryani in it. I'm like, does she know how complicated it is to make biryani? Um, but I, I added, I put a, a biryani recipe in there. And then the, the, um, the non-alcoholic cocktail is a very Camila thing to have a, a themed cocktail for her party. So that's why I added it. Um, I'm struggling right now with Jana because I do want to put a, a, a recipe in there, but they're traveling the whole book. They're not cooking. So I'm going to have to play around. I may have to... Uh, Stick a, stick a food scene in there just so that I can have a recipe. Yeah, we, we demand a food scene. <laughs> speak for all readers. Well, we are at eight o'clock. Thank you so much for coming, all of you. And thanks to the lovely authors for this very fun chat. So we hope to see you soon at the next event. Um, and everyone have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Congratulations. Congrats, Thank yes, you. happy release day. Happy yeah. book birthday. Happy book birthday.